this is a region that is leaning into the future and the future of opportunity, when I think other parts of the world, even before recent events, were kind of lagging a bit and were just trying to kind of just shrug off the pandemic. This isn't a region that's been trying to shrug off the pandemic. This is a region that's literally going, right, that's where we're going and we're going to chase that opportunity um, and they've still got a massive ambition. Hello and welcome to Comms Life. I'm your host, Thomas Billinghurst. Every episode, we explore the topics and trends shaping the communications industry with those on the front lines of defining what we say and how we say it. With a major shift underway in the Middle East as the UAE transitions to a new Monday to Friday working week, the business landscape has altered irreversibly. So what are the challenges of this new playing field? for businesses, corporations and governments? And what role do we as communicators have in telling the story as it unfolds? Joining me to discuss these questions and more is Scott Armstrong, Editor-in-Chief of Arabian Business. Scott, thanks for joining us. Good to be here, Thomas. Thanks so much for taking the time from, from a busy schedule. Let's get stuck straight into it. We've got a new working week in the UAE, Monday to Friday. How has it impacted the business landscape of both the UAE and the wider region? It's been, a, I mean, it's a really interesting question and it's had a number of impacts. I mean, when we look at it from a journalistic perspective, we used to operate on this kind of, you know, obviously Sunday to Thursday. Um, so Sunday was always a quiet day, but lots of activity here in the Gulf, but nothing internationally. And then you could always count on, you know, on the Friday, which was a downtime here, there was still lots going on internationally. So uh, it's changed that kind of reporting cycle a little bit. But in terms of the business climate, I think it's been a masterstroke from the UE's perspective, because not only have they realigned with the international markets, which obviously makes trading much easier for them, but they've also introduced it in a way that discusses mental health, work-life balance, which is something I'm super, super passionate about. Um, so it's been an incredible sort of, if you talk about messaging PR and comms, like to say to the world, we are a place to come and work and you know, in terms of talent attraction, mm -hmm. to say we've got a four and a half day working week, which isn't in reality for a lot of the business landscape yet, because it hasn't quite evolved to that perspective yet. But if you're working in the government, if you're working in the school sector, and the fact that you've got a government that is basically in black and white saying, we have enshrined this 4.5 working day week. We have moved away from this system of work that we've done for a hundred years and it hasn't evolved, to adopt flexible working, to adopt wellness to adopt a work-life balance. I think it's just a tremendously positive message. And I think from a comms perspective to people thinking, shall I come to the UAE and live and work? It's a real bonus. Have you seen that then in, in reality? Have you seen more people looking to join the likes of, of an ITP or an Arabian business because of those newly aligned hours? I think there's that. But the UAE has been on a bit of a crest of a wave recently. I mean, look, we've got revamped labour laws. Um, they've revamped the laws on discrimination, flexible working, if we go back in time. So we've now got the working week. We had FDI, which was also, so investors can now come and invest and not have to give away 50% of their business. We've got a whole new raft of personal laws that were revamped. So, and equally, you've had the UE's incredible handling of the pandemic. I mean, and we all remember what at the time seemed like quite a harsh lockdown, you know, the, the six week where we couldn't go out. But after six weeks, we were all back and we were all open. And we've seen the evidence and the fruits of that again right now. Whereas, you know, the PCR te pre-arrival PCR test has just been dropped. We don't have to wear masks outside. Uh, we talk to people all the time, uh, particularly high net worth individuals who bring in their businesses here. And basically a lot of them came for a bit of a pandemic holiday. Because they, they'd heard, right, this place is open, I can go to the restaurants, the, you know, yeah. it's safe, the cases are low, all that sort of thing. And they came, they looked around, and then they saw the ease of doing business. And there is, there are still on a, you know, the UE is on an evolving journey on that one. But they saw what was here, just looked around and went, well, look, particularly considering the pandemic has accelerated remote working, I can run my operation from anywhere in the world. There's lots of kind of different drivers from different geographies where they've gone, well, look, the UAE is the place to be. And I think they've really lent into it and taken the opportunity. You know, in many regions, people will look back at the way the UAE has handled the pandemic and go, that was absolutely textbook and continues to be so. How does it fit into the, the wider narrative in the region then? Because 
you know, as context is Vision 2030 underway in Saudi. Uh, there's the World Cup coming up in Qatar. Um, has the UAE shift had any kind of ripple effect? Can we expect other countries to follow its lead? What's the, the sentiment on that? I mean, it's going to be an interesting one on the working week one. Um, and I know, you know plenty of people who also work in the communications industry here that have got clients in Saudi Arabia or in Oman or in yeah. Qatar, which it, it's creating a bit of a, you know, uh, uh, that situation where you've got clients who are starting work on a Sunday. Um, so how do you, you know, how do you accommodate that? So I've got, you know, big sympathy for you on that front. Thanks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there are always rumours. There have been rumours that Saudi's going to go for a four-day week. Um, we'll see where Oman goes. I, I think it's less about, the, probably less about the wellness and more about the aligning to the global markets because yeah. this part of the region, the GCC, is becoming much more of a global trading hub than it's ever been. In terms of is the UE impacting what Saudi is? I think there's a, you know, the GCC, like the UE used to be, and it was described by a columnist in Arabian business as like the best house on, a, you know, on a, on, a, on a slightly less desirable street, shall we say. But then we've seen what's happening in Qatar and we've seen what's happening with the Qatar World Cup. We've seen Saudi Arabia and the massive journey that they've been on in the last two years. And I think all of a sudden, where the GCC is almost, it's like a gentrifying neighborhood. There's so much improvement going on in so many different spaces. Even Oman is trying to like lean into value and lean into the things that it does well. So increasingly, this is one of the reasons why I think Britain's looking at a free trade agreement with the GCC. Um, because they see the opportunity, they see how much trade there is, and they see how much potential. And then you've got Saudi Arabia, <coughs> obviously hugely, you know, got huge resources at, at its disposal um, with its 2030 plan, with NEOM, with the line, with projects like that. So this is a region that is leaning into the future and the future of opportunity, when I think other parts of the world, even before recent events, were kind of lagging a bit and were just trying to kind of shrug off the pandemic. This isn't a region that's been trying to shrug off the pandemic. This is a region that's literally going, right, that's where we're going, and we're going to chase that opportunity, um, and they've still got massive ambition. One of the benefits of this region, as you'll know, is we've got such a young population, which means we've got so much energy and so much ambition in this region. So I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't bet against the UE or Saudi or Qatar you know, achieving their aims, because they've just got the ambition, they've got the determination, they've got the the structure of governance, shall we say, to set a plan and see it through, and they've got the resources behind it to make it happen. In terms of um, your less emphasis on chasing a news story and getting news up as it breaks and being more of an informed, thoughtful space for business stories, is that something that you've driven because you've mentioned before you're a big advocate of mental health and balancing work and life? Is that an agenda you've driven? Well, um, I mean, I, I, I was fortunate enough. I did 30 years in journalism. Yeah, 30 years in journalism. And then I took a little bit of a break and I went into comms. But one of the things I kind of learned when I was working with clients and working with them is a, a lot of talk about purpose and passion, you know, um, and you began to see kind of authenticity really have value in the world. So when I went back into journalism, I actually, you know, I actually set out a plan and a strategy, which is we want to be a brand that has a purpose. Um, and it, oh, so it coincided nicely with the fact that I've been on an evolving path of purpose and passion, shall we say. So I, I've got a young daughter, so diversity and inclusion is incredibly important to me because mm. I don't see why she should have to grow up in a world where she has any less opportunity than I do just because of a chromosome. Um, I have personal reasons in my family why mental health is so important to me. And I've seen that, I've, you know, um, also from employment experiences and the damage that toxic work cultures can have on individuals. I see the ROI of doing the right thing or trying to amplify the right thing. Uh, that's not necessarily a headline traffic grabber, but I do think it brings people back to you more and more because they realise that you believe something as opposed to you're just trying to get clicks off misery, shall we say. We're all reporting about the, the rise in the UAE property market and particularly here in Dubai, and that's a, that's a positive economic factor. But what does that actually mean? You know, there's plenty of people right now who've had an eviction notice pinned to their door, shall we say, because the landlords want to take advantage of this increasing market. And there's a lot of people under pressure being asked to leave their accommodation at short notice. And they actually don't have to because the UE has actually got their back. So it's how do we lean into things like that where we can kind of add some value to a conversation. And that's a big story. You know, that's a big economic story. 
but we can still drill, drill into it and go, okay, how can we help? How can we add value? I think that's where we're at right now. There's two things that you mentioned there that I find fascinating. And um, I'll ask you both at the same time and, and take them however you will. You went from a uh, long storied career in journalism, working on local papers all the way up to the likes of the national, then made a jump over to a communications consultancy and then came back to journalism to, yeah. to, to run a show at Arabian Business. What was the reason for the, the jump to comms and then back to journalism? And how have they complemented each other? How have you found them beneficial for what you're doing now? Genuinely, the two years I spent in comms was incredibly educational. I was really glad I made the decision. I mean, I had a, a you know, great job running a newspaper in Oman. Um, and we also grew, when we grew it into the most successful digital media business in, in Oman. Uh, but even then, I had began, began to have some concerns about the media industry in general, and that, that we're not revamping our business models, and we're not, uh, we're just trying to keep doing things the same way over and over again. And so there was that, and also I was just, I don't know, like I'd done 30 years, I'd done a really good job, and I just thought, you know what, I want to kind of peer behind the net curtain. And then when I did, you know, and I've, I said this to you before we came onto the podcast, like I think a lot of people in journalism don't realise a how much creativity and hard work there is going on in the comm side because you know you are affectionately, affectionately known in the journalism world as the dark side. Yep. And secondly, you know, just how you are the gatekeepers quite often. You sit around the table with people of influence and hear what's actually happening, whereas the journalist, it's our job to try and get as much at that. But it was a really fascinating experience mm. to be on that side of it. And then there's all sorts of communicate. Like we think in journalism that we are the communication platform. We, we actually think that the work that we do is enough Whereas you go into a, into a project and go, right, let's look at our communications plans. And it, it, it's like three-dimensional chess. You know, you've got your earned channels, which is your traditional media, but you've got your own channels, you've got your social, you've got your paid, you've got the influence. All these different tactics that you bring to a communications campaign. Whereas we just think, oh, we, we hardly ever PR our own story, shall we say, even if we get an exclusive. We wouldn't then send that to the Times or something like that because we just, well, no, people naturally pick it up on our side. Um, I see the media industry, industry still struggling. Social media has not been good for, well, you know, my personal opinion is it's not been great for society, but it's also not been good for the media industry. And I also, you know, not only has it sucked out the advertising um, out of the media industry, but it's also then forced the industry to try and lean into engagement, mm. which often is, you know, the, the reporting of anger as opposed to balanced reporting. Yeah. So I kind of wanted to go back into journalism to maybe just see if I could use some of the, the, t the tricks and techniques that comms had taught me to kind of do things a slightly different way. Um, and again, that's also that whole purpose, passion, value, which so often, you know, communication agencies were trying to find that secret source within companies to try and find out what their actual purpose in the world was. Yeah. And I wanted to try and be a brand at Arabian Business that particularly coming, because I joined mid-pandemic, um, where a lot of things were locked down and a lot of businesses were struggle, struggling. Um, and my kind of mission statement was, well, let's come try and help. Let's be part of the business community. Let's try and lift up. And I still very much believe in that. I'm still about trying to lift up people, whether it be the startup community, whether it be mental health, whether it be just, just the general daily reportage. My just personal passion is lifting people up and seeing the value that when you highlight some inspirational kid who's got this startup and then they go and succeed, that, that, that to me is, is value. So your approach to reporting and, and writing, Scott, you, you say there it's about uplifting people. And, and when, as one example, we've spoken about the UAE, you, you speak about it in glowing terms, progressive, futuristic. We know that that's not necessarily always the attitude that's taken by Western outlets. Yeah. Um, why do you think you've arrived at, at this approach to what the UAE is doing? Is it being based here and not reporting on it from afar and seeing what's happening on the ground? I think there's a, definitely a degree of that. I mean, look, I've been here 12 years. I did four years in um, Abu Dhabi. I then went and did four years in Oman to win a newspaper and then came back to Dubai um, four years ago and spent two years just going back, chuttling backwards and forwards to Saudi Arabia. So very much saw Saudi Arabia going on a journey of change. Uh, I've seen the UAE since I arrived go on a journey of evolution. But if we look back to sort of 10, 12 years ago, um, 
you know, the UE has come a long way as it has. You know, the, the, the growth is exponential, shall we say, or the change is exponential. And is it there yet? No, I don't think it would claim that it's yet, there yet. You look at the journey of women in Saudi Arabia, which has actually been astronomical over the two years yet. Is it there yet? No, it's not. You look at the UK now, there's still a massive gender divide in the pay gap. So for, for everyone who sits, you know, and it's that, it is that old phrase, like people in glass houses, before you throw the stone, have a look at your own house. And yes, Saudi Arabia have made missteps and mistakes, and there have been things that have hit the headlines which were awful, frankly. Um, and they've taken some responsibilities for those as well. But when you look at the, if you sit and work with 90% of the Saudi Arabia, the kids that I worked with, ambitious, hungry, lots of potential, decent, honest, and just want to succeed in life. All the same drivers, you know, but it's easy, easy for, for media outside of this region to paint an unfair picture of what happens inside of this, this region. And that is not giving them a, you know, a get out free jail card. There is things that need to improve, but if you were to look at the, if you were to do a timeline and do an exponential graph of change, societal change, I would say, mm. you know, if you look particularly, you look at the UE right now and then plot where it goes and then you overlay that with Europe, UK, US, I think it would hold up favorably. We hope you're enjoying this APCO Worldwide production. To find out more of what we do in the communication space, head to apcoworldwide.com and see how we are helping firms build back stronger. Welcome back to Comms Life. We're still here with Scott Armstrong, Editor-in-Chief of Arabian Business. Now, Scott, in this part of the show, we want to get to know the person beneath the professional. So I've got some getting to know you questions to unearth your, your true self, if you're okay with those to come your way. Uh, I, I apologise to your audience in advance. Good. Apologies out of the way. Let's do it. Um, classic, earliest childhood memory. Oh, that's a good one. Um, probably breaking my evil Knievel wind-up stunt bike, which I thought was the best thing ever, and it broke, and I was gutted. And I think that's the... I got it for Christmas. It's, it's either that or my Steve Austin Bionic Man doll playing with that. That's probably the earliest thing I've got. Not particularly inspirational. And that's the bottom line? Because yeah. Stone Cold said so, right? That guy. Okay. If you were president of the world mm -hmm. for one day, what's the one thing you would do? Legislate social media immediately there are lots of good things that social media give us connectivity i see some good you know you look at canada la Mary, you know influence like that doing trying to put a positive message out into the world but it's been weaponized by so many um entities shall we say it's doing so much damage i've got a six-year-old girl i see the damage that social media can do to kids um, i'm a massive fan of linkedin i think it's a great platform but i think legislation for all of the social media platforms so we can't have the anonymous trolling so we can't have the fake news so we can't have um, the you know the polarizing impact that it's had in the world and that's not me talking as like a disgruntled journalist that you know because they've ruined the advertising market for us i i've thought for a long time that we were lazy and we should have changed our business model in journalism. I just think from a society point of view, um, I don't think, you know, I'm a realist, we're never gonna get rid of it, but I do think it needs to be legislated. Done, motion passed. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? Parenting, so I could actually get some sleep and not be so tired all the time. Books or TV and film? At the minute, it's probably audible. Because I haven't got the time to read the books, which is a real shame. But I've got, a, you know, I've got a nice commute, so I've gone through some really good authors. Oh, are we um, talking on, audio books, not uh, podcasts? Audio books. No. So it is books, I suppose, but it's audio yeah. books. Um, yeah, and I've read some tremendous books recently. So, well, read. I've listened to some tremendous books recently. Imbibed some tremendous exactly, books. Exactly, yeah. Beautiful. TikTok or Twitter? Well, I think you probably know my answer. Considering <laughs> it's going to be neat. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a terrible dancer, so it's not TikTok. And I think, I think Twitter, with the greatest respect to Twitter, I think it's incredibly polarising and incredible. There's, there's a lot of... So neither, shall we say. Neither. It's probably LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Yeah. Let's scratch we can have Twitter a slightly, and LinkedIn. slightly more sensible conversation there. Finally, if I wasn't in journalism, media or comms, I would be? Um, that is a good question. Um, it's a question 
particularly I'm 50 this year, so you continue to ask yourself that all the time. I've been really lucky with the Raven business because we do get to lean into the value side of things. If I wasn't doing that, I would hope it would be something more, again, in the value side, in, in helping people, whether that be through writing or whatever it is. But I, I couldn't tell you what that, what that is, but journalism has given me a platform through my life which I've used a few times to help. We've changed the law to protect children, I've helped people get jobs. Um, so it can be incredibly, uh, an incredible powerful tool. And here in the UE, you know, Arabian Business is letting us talk about diversity and inclusion. It is letting us talk about mental health. So that's great. If I didn't have that, I hope it would be more of the same, but helping. It's not about the acquisition of things, it's about how I can pay things forward so that my daughter grows up into a slightly better world. Perfect. Scott Armstrong, thanks so much for joining us on Comms Life. You're very welcome, Thomas. Thanks for listening to Comms Life. If you liked that, leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts. Send us any questions or comments on our Twitter page. And while you're at it, you can subscribe to and download Comms Life on our YouTube channel or wherever you get your podcasts from. Stay safe and be well. Thank you.